Good afternoon, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today. Today's Cancer Care virtual seminar topic is metastatic breast cancer to bone. And my name is Annie Gebby. I'm an outreach coordinator for the Samaritan Cancer Resource Center. And today I'll be your host and moderator. This event is brought to you by the Samaritan Cancer Resource Center. We partner with anyone touched by cancer to provide the support they need to live with strength, determination, and hope into the future. Joining us today for the third time is Dr. Nicholas Tedesco. Dr. Tedesco is an orthopedic oncology for the Samaritan Medical Group. We're so glad that he's here today to talk to us about metastatic breast cancer. And it's now my pleasure to turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much. You know, as Annie said, my name is Nicholas Tedesco. I do orthopedic oncology and complex reconstruction here at Good Samaritan Regional Medical Center in Corvallis. Um, and I'm affiliated with the Pastega Cancer Center as a result. Um, some of the presentation today is going to be redundant if you've been part of my previous presentation, but we've got a lot of newcomers today, so we'll rehash out some of the old topics, but we're going to introduce some new ones. And so today what we're specifically talking about is metastatic breast cancer to bone, uh, because that's what I see. So primary breast cancer is what's known as cancer that's confined to the breast tissue and its ducts, and that's it. Um, once it has started to spread, whether that's to lymphatics or then to the liver or the lungs or anything like that, we call it metastatic. That means that the tumor is no longer only at its site of origin. And so specifically when it involves bone, that's where I tend to get involved. So that's what we'll talk about today. <clears throat> so what is breast cancer and uh, how does it spread and what happens when it does? That's one of the topics we're going to kind of address today. And then we'll talk about what exactly is orthopedic oncology, what do I do, where did it come from, and what are we doing here specifically in Corvallis that can help out um, in these sort of unfortunate circumstances once the tumor has had an opportunity to spread. So we'll start off with breast cancer as a general topic. And so breast cancer is a cancer of breast tissue origin. And so there's a couple of tissues within the breast. The first is glandular tissues that create the breast milk themselves. These are what are called lobular carcinomas when these become cancerous. The ducts that then carry the breast milk from those glands out through the skin surface at the level of the nipple and areola, that's what we call ductal carcinoma. These are by far and away the two most common types of breast cancer, but there are many other types and subtypes. Both men and women can get breast cancer. Men actually do have breast tissue, but less than 2% of all uh, cases of breast cancer actually occur in men. 98 plus percent occur in women. This is the most common cancer in women in the United States. Breast lumps are very common and the vast majority of them are benign. So they can often be very confusing. And especially in young women, there's something called fibrocystic change in breasts that are very common that masquerade as a tumor and are often get confused for malignancy, but thankfully they are not. And so not all breast lumps are bad necessarily. They definitely need to be looked at by a physician to make sure particularly given that breast cancer is so common in women, but thankfully, most of the time you get good news back. <clears throat> so what are some statistics on this? So one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer at some point in their lifetime. That's a lot. So essentially what that means is probably on a long enough timeline, every woman would get breast cancer. This can be genetic and passed from one generation to the next. So the most common and the biggest one we hear about is what's called the BRCA genetic mutation. That stands for breast cancer. And this was discovered to be present in familial cases of breast cancer where you would have you know, a grandmother, a mother, a daughter, a granddaughter, all developing breast cancer at young ages. And so geneticists started saying, okay, what's going on here? Is there a link? And lo and behold, there is. And so there's a couple of different BRCA mutations and there are also many other mutations that have since been discovered, but these are the most common that can be uh, inherited within the family where multiple generations and multiple siblings can develop breast cancer. Each year in the United States, over 300,000 of new, new cases of breast cancer will be diagnosed. 
and almost 45,000 women will die of breast cancer. So this is extremely common, it's extremely widespread, and it's a huge disease burden on our society. Most, or I'm sorry, bone metastases are present in about 55% of cases where the cancer has spread beyond the breast and local lymph nodes. So the breast cancers tend to spread via the lymph system rather than the blood vessels. And so at, they tend to spread in a characteristic order where first they spread to the lymph nodes that drain that particular area, then they spread beyond that to the organs and then to bones, but not always. So there are breast cancers that spread to bone and organs. There are breast cancers that spread only to bone and there are breast cancers that spread only to organs. And so whenever it has spread beyond those local lymph nodes, we call it stage four cancer, because that means the horse is way out of the barn, it has spread very far away from the breast. <clears throat> whenever we stage a tumor and we call it stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, what that's designed to do is number one, predict prognosis and therefore maybe predict survival but it also helps us drive our treatments in terms of if you have stage three, there's gonna be an algorithm for where you're at in stage three that says you should probably have this treatment and this treatment because those are the best practices and that's where we see the best results. However, what we find is that not all stage four is equivalent. And so even though you might be diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, there are many different ways that stage four can be interpreted. Again, depending on where it is, how many places it's at, you know, all of those things play a role. So for instance, median breast, or I'm sorry, median survival after diagnosis of stage four breast cancer is only about two years, but that's where you're looking at all comers. So if it is spread very widely, then even with our best methods, sometimes we can't catch up to it and the patient has less than two years left. However, there are some patients with stage four breast cancer that die very rapidly. And then there are some patients with stage four breast cancer that we can cure and get a very long lasting remission out of. So not all benefit goes to the brain, for instance. If it metastasizes only to organs, those patients do better and survive longer than when it's in the bones and the solid organs like the liver and the other variables that matter. 50% of patients with brain metastases will not survive three years, while 76% of bone-only metastases will. So in general, when breast cancer metastasizes to the bone and it has spread, obviously any spread is, is not going to be great news, but it tends to do better when it's confined to the bone because we have more tools available to help treat it and these particular cancers that have that predilection seem to behave a little bit less aggressively. The problem though, once it's in the bone, is that it can weaken the bone structurally, and that can be very painful, or the bone can even fracture with little or no energy at all. <clears throat> Normally, once the cancer has metastasized to bone, it becomes a multidisciplinary approach to try and treat it. it you combine therapy with surgery for the bone issues and the structural issues, chemotherapy for the disease itself and the fact that it is spread, and radiation to kill the tumor locally wherever the bone disease is to help provide structural support and give a scaffolding back for the bone to regenerate itself. So treatment algorithms do exist based on the patient age and health as well as their stage of disease as we talked about. But again, it becomes more customized than that, especially in stage four because it's not a perfect predictor and there's not a perfect algorithm. Every patient and every specific situation can be very different. And so this is just kind of a, a, an overview here of the multidisciplinary care that goes on with all of the green lines representing, you know, the patient's visits and who they see and who they're directly involved with. But all the blue lines represent the lines of communication in the background. So while the patient's not even aware of it, I'm talking with the medical oncologist and they're reaching out to the pathologist and we're talking with the radiologist. And, you know, so there's a lot that goes on in the background to customize cancer care for patients and try and come up with what is going to be the best solution for this particular patient with this particular problem. And so that's one of the big roles that we, we try to accomplish here with the Pastega Cancer Center. And we do have 
what's called a multidisciplinary tumor board where we meet on a periodic basis to discuss these issues where we're all actually in one big room together and then everyone can weigh in and so we can figure out not only the best treatment but what's the timing of that treatment who goes first is it radiation is it interventional radiology is it surgery you know and try and plot out you know the best potential algorithm that's going to help this patient out <clears throat> so what are we doing kind of locally and nationally with, through Good Samaritan uh, for, you know, metastatic breast cancer patients? Well, we're actually doing quite a bit here. So first off, our medical oncology team does participate in multiple clinical trials. And so occasionally they're involved in clinical trials that involve stage four breast cancer, where we get to try the you know, latest and greatest um, new medications that aren't even on the market yet or something like that where we can get patients into clinical trials when we might not otherwise have had any other treatment options remaining. We do keep a local database and case repository of all of these uh, cancer cases precisely so that we can do research on it and try and come up with better and improved ways of treating these things or even be able to look at patients' tumors and genetically map them out and try and start figuring out uh, risk factors or what's a targetable gene that we can hit with a certain drug that maybe will finally destroy this tumor and before we didn't have something like that. So there's a lot of different things we can do by keeping that database. The next thing is, is we do plan to contribute starting either end of this year or into next year for a national sarcoma database, which is another type of rare cancer but that's going to include metastatic carcinoma cases, which breast cancer falls under. And so the hope with that is that the Musculoskeletal Tumor Society, which is the group that oversees orthopedic oncologists, we're going to all be participating in that. Now we can keep track of every single case in America and start to answer some really meaningful research questions as we have more and more numbers and better and better power to answer those questions. So this could be a game changer for research in general throughout the entire United States. Currently, I serve on the uh, Guidelines and Evidence-Based Medicine Committee nationally with that Musculoskeletal Tumor Society. So we're tasked with coming up with um, clinical practice guidelines, appropriate use criteria, basically evidence-based reviews of the medical literature to provide instruction and direction to physicians for best practices. You know, what's the best available evidence out there for how we can treat, you know, X, Y, or Z. And so that's one of the roles that I play nationally. Additionally, I serve on the board of directors of the Musculoskeletal Oncology Research Initiative, which is a national consortium of smaller centers like ours, where we're not a major academic center like a Mayo Clinic or something like that. And so in order for us to be able to contribute meaningfully in research, we need to, to pool our efforts and combine our efforts. And so this research initiative is a series of small centers throughout the entire United States that we then can get together and streamline multi-center studies so that we can all kind of uh, get our collective data, bring it all together, and then maybe be able to answer a research question much better than I would be able to on my own out here on my island in Corvallis. We also have a residency program here that trains the next generation of orthopedic surgeons. And we just had our first resident go into orthopedic oncology graduate last year. He's currently doing his fellowship in this at Huntsman Cancer Institute in Utah. And um, we have another resident currently that's in his second year of training out of five, and he plans on going into this when he's done as well. So hopefully we're, we're gonna help kind of populate the US with guys that can, can handle these sorts of issues. <clears throat> so historically, uh, patients would have to travel long distances to find an orthopedic oncology specialist, but most cases were easily managed by a local community orthopedic surgeon, and that's because when you look 30 years ago, the survival with stage four breast cancer when it was in bone was very dismal. Most patients didn't live more than a couple of months, and we had very few options for them. Now that we're in the age of more customized cancer care and what's called targeted chemotherapy, where we have a lot of different chemotherapy agents that can target specific mutations that certain cancers harbor, we have a much larger armamentarium to slow this disease process down. And so we're seeing patients live a lot longer with their cancer and we're turning it almost more into a chronic disease. So we're now seeing patients with stage four cancer live years. And 
why that's important is because that now changes what we can surgically offer these patients. Historically, 30 years ago, if a patient had breast cancer in a bone and the bone fractured, a community orthopedic surgeon could fix it and they would do okay. And they would usually, you know, eventually succumb to their disease long before that fixation had a chance to fail. Now we're seeing patients outlive their fixation and eventually the implant, whether it's plate and screws or a nail or something like that, just falls apart because the bone around it has fallen apart. And now we've got a huge problem on our hands. And so now this is becoming much more specialized to have an orthopedic oncologist step in to be able to do our sort of special techniques that try and prevent those types of failures in patients. And so now it's becoming more of a challenge to get these patients taken care of because we are very few and far between. Because the patients are living longer, they require more advanced expertise. So I've been servicing the southern half of Oregon since 2016, but I'm only one of five orthopedic oncologists in the entire state of Oregon, and I'm the only one outside of Portland. I'm the only one between Portland and Sacramento. In fact, there's only about 125 to 150 active orthopedic oncologists in the entire United States. So because of that, some patients have to travel 10, 12 hours to be able to meet with us. And then as you can imagine, stick around and get managed and follow up and all of that. So there's a pretty big burden on the patients and their families to have to travel these long distances for their care. And so that's another goal of ours here is to be able to provide that to the Willamette Valley as well as, as, well as the Southern half of Oregon to be able to cut down on their travel time to some of these other centers. So, that's a nice segue into orthopedic oncology. Because we're so rare, there are many physicians out there that, don't, that have never even heard of orthopedic oncology. And so the big question always is, well, what exactly is that? Where do we come from? What do we do? Well, orthopedic oncology is basically surgical management of tumors of the trunk, the buttocks, the arms, the pelvis, the legs, and you know, basically anywhere that's not specifically the spine the brain or the, the face and, and neck. And so the H-E-N-T docs get up there, the neurosurgeons get the brain and the, and the neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons get the spine. And so we get pretty much everywhere else. So we tend to manage tumors when they arise or involve bones, nerves, or soft tissues, you know, like muscle, tendon, ligament, that sort of thing. We manage both benign and malignant tumors. The most common benign tumors that we see are lipomas, which are benign fatty tumors, nerve sheath tumors that arise in our peripheral nerves, and what are called osteochondromas, which are these benign developmental bony outgrowths that a lot of young people um, experience. The common malignancies that we tend to manage or cancers are things called sarcomas, which are malignancies that arise within the connective tissue in our body and then metastatic carcinoma, which are tumors that arise in the linings in our body that then spread to the musculoskeletal system. So I highlighted that here in bold, <clears throat> excuse me, because breast cancer falls into that category. So it is a carcinoma. And when it comes to see me, it usually has metastasized either to a muscle or soft tissue or to bone. Uh, lymphoma involving bone and multiple myeloma are two other very common cancers that we manage and treat as well. Tumor-like conditions that we see and treat are things that sort of mimic tumors or mimic the treatment of a tumor. So things like infections, immune system reactive processes, and hemangiomas, which are these large collections of blood vessels, can look act, behave, uh, show up on imaging, and look just like a tumor. And so we manage them in similar ways. The flip side of that is whenever a tumor is involving a bone and we have to cut the bone out, we have to reconstruct that. We want to rebuild that bone and establish a, a good functional leg or, or arm for the patient. And so the natural offshoot is total joint replacement and revision total joint replacement because you're doing the same thing. You're cutting out some bone and then you're replacing it with metal and plastic. And so we do that on a much larger scale with the tumors, but that's a lot of the things that we tend to manage. So orthopedic oncology really didn't exist until about the late 1970s. And that's really when uh, chemotherapy came around for what's called osteosarcoma, which is a very rare uh, primary cancer of bone. Um, and this is where limb salvage surgery finally became an option. So before the 1970s and 60s, 
if you had an osteosarcoma, the treatment was immediate amputation, and that's all we had for it. And we found that even with an immediate amputation, less than 10% of those patients were alive at five years because the tumor would spread um, usually to the lungs. But then when chemotherapy came around, we were now able to change that to about a 70% five-year survival. So now patients are living longer and being cured, and so we had to come up with a better option than just cutting their leg off. And so we started dabbling with a lot of different technologies at that time to try and figure out how can we safely cut these tumors out and rebuild a functional extremity for the patient. As we talked about before, there's less than 150 of us active in, the, in North America right now and less than 250 worldwide with the vast majority of them having trained here in the U.S. So really we train almost the world's orthopedic oncologists. The grandfathers of this and the guys that really started it and turned it into a profession are these four gentlemen down here back in the 70s and 80s. So Bill Enneking was at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Henry Mankin was at Harvard in Boston. Michael Simon was at the University of Chicago in Chicago. And Jeff Eckert was at UCLA down in, in LA. So once upon a time, if you had a sarcoma or metastatic carcinoma that was a challenging treatment, you would have to fly to LA from the West Coast in order to get your treatment from Jeff Eckhart. Now, thankfully, we're at least peppered around here and there enough that hopefully you have better access to us and we have better continuity of care with patients. <clears throat> so what exactly is limb salvage surgery? Limb salvage surgery is basically anything but amputation. And so this can involve removal of the tumor alone, where sometimes we just cut the tumor out or we cure it out, which is basically means scooping it out from where it is. And we do nothing else. Nothing else needs to be done. And that, that alone can get the, the limb to heal and do perfectly fine. Sometimes we can remove the tumor, but we have to then fix the bone because it's already broken or something like that. And so that's where we add internal fixation with plates and screws, a metal rod, and sometimes we even add bone cement to that, which is sort of the way a dentist fills a cavity, but on a much larger scale. We can remove the tumor and maybe have a soft tissue reconstruction. So sometimes the tumor is involving the bone and a muscle, let's say. And so we have to remove the bone and the muscle. So now what do we do? We're worried about that patient not being able to function well. Well, thankfully in our bodies, we have a lot of muscles that perform the same tasks as another muscle. So if we have to sacrifice one of those muscles, we can then take the other muscle and use it to our advantage to still provide the same function. So we can advance or transfer that muscle to a different part of the anatomy to give it better function. Sometimes we have to cut a blood vessel out, so we have to do a bypass graft for that vessel. Sometimes we have to cut a lot of skin out and you need a flap or a graft or something like that. And so plastic surgery sometimes plays a role in our surgeries as well. We can do tumor removal with bone reconstruction. So rather than soft tissue, now we've got a bone that has to come out. And so these are what are called intercalary procedures, meaning you replace a segment of bone without touching the adjacent joint that's either at the top or bottom of that bone. So you jump the gap with a big chunk of metal that usually has a stem that goes up and down the remaining bone, and then you either glue it in or fix it in with screws. Tumor removal with artificial joint replacement is now where it does involve a joint surface. So you have to replace the bone with metal, and then you replace the joint with metal and plastic. Management of failure of these constructions with revision surgery is also a huge part of limb salvage surgery. Same thing early on in, you know, as we were developing these technologies, if most of the time these surgeries would be custom, meaning we would look at a patient's x-ray, we would figure out what needs to be cut out, we would measure that precisely, we would then send that to a company, they would manufacture us an artificial bone that would fit in that segment, and then we put it in. But if it failed or it got infected or it broke in half or it didn't quite fit right, that was custom built. There's not another one we can try. And so we would secondarily have to amputate these patients because we don't have another option. Now, thankfully, we have a lot of these things off the shelf. And so we can customize them intraoperatively and make changes on the fly. So it gives us a lot more armamentarium to not only make it better off the bat, but if and when these do have structural problems or failures, we can fix it again. Uh, so we no longer have to perform amputations nearly to the level that we once did. 
So tumor removal alone, you know, as we talked about before, just means cutting the tumor out. So basically you expose the area, you cut it out, and then you walk away. So this is usually for areas in the bone that are expendable or non-structural, meaning they're not involved with weight bearing. Uh, you can do this with navigation or augmented reality, which is basically what this picture is showing on the right here. So this is a picture of a patient that had a rare tumor in her pelvis, and this was just to sort of illustrate the point. And so the, what the imaging is showing is a CT scan of her pelvis, and you can see the hip joints here. That's the ball in the socket. And this blue line is a probe that we're actually using to localize her anatomy with a computer so that the computer can then understand exactly where we are on her pelvis. That then enables us to make a cut right through the pelvis where we can miss the hip joint and miss the tumor. If we have to do this blindly, more than likely, we're gonna either end up in the tumor or in the joint, neither of which would be good. So these newer technologies now allow us to thread this thin needle and this thin gap between them and make better you know, resections for better tumor management, but also to preserve anatomy better so we don't have to do a huge hip replacement on someone. So tumor removal alone sometimes can be very challenging, but it can be very beneficial to the patient, patient rather than having to rebuild that bone. The next part here is internal fixation. So this is where you have bone with structural failures. So this is where the breast cancer has spread to the bone. It starts to grow in the bone, it overtakes the bone, then the bone starts to disappear, and now there's no structural integrity left to it, and the bone can fracture with little to no energy or even just from the muscles pulling on it, like reaching out to turn on a light switch or something like that. And so that's what this is an image of here is this is a patient that had metastatic breast cancer to the middle of her humerus. She had an artificial shoulder joint up top. So that's this big white circle up here. And unfortunately, you can see her bone stopped here and picked up here and just disappeared right in the middle and she had a fracture. Well, because this is blocking us, we have to do a plate and screws from outside the bone so that our screws miss everything. So we are able to plate almost her entire humerus to jump that gap, and then we filled that cavity with bone cement so that right away we've got rigid support and fixation so that even after this surgery, structurally, she can move this arm and do anything she wants right away precisely so that you know, she doesn't have to spend a year rehabbing from this and taking time and being non-weight bearing. So we've now got the tools that allow you to do stuff with that arm right away. Here's another one where you have the lesion up here in the bone where there's a hole in the bone and you can see all this lumpy bumpy stuff out here. This is the bone healing on the outside after we treated this, but there was a fracture across here. And so instead of going outside the bone with our fixation, we go inside the bone with our fixation. So this is a big, long stabilizing nail that then has these locking screws that come through it so that it can't piston, windshield wiper, or rotate. So these stabilize it. And down here, there's some interlocking screws too. But now we can stabilize that entire bone. We can jump this gap and again, give immediate structural support to the bone to allow for full weight bearing right off the bat. Now we get into what's called endoprosthetic reconstruction. So this is now where we're not fixing the bone, we're replacing it. <clears throat> so as we talked about earlier, there's something called an intercalary replacement. That's where you preserve the joints, but you have to replace some bone in between them. So that's what this first picture is here in the upper left, where we have a bone above, bone below, and a big defect that we created in the middle to cut out a tumor and then we jump that gap with a big chunk of metal and then a rod that goes into both ends of the bone and this haze around there, you can see that cement. And so we glue it in there basically and that allows us to keep the leg, keep the bone and keep that patient's function going. Then you can have simple joint replacement. So this is a standard hip replacement, but this was a patient that had uh, metastatic cancer to the upper part of the femur here because it was so close to the joint and there was so much bone gone, there's really no way to fix it. So instead we just replace it. So this patient gets an artificial hip joint. Then we talk about what's called mega endoprosthetics. These are large chunks of bone that need to be replaced, not just a joint surface like here. 
So here is where you replace like an entire femur, for instance. So here's an artificial knee at the bottom, artificial hip at the top, and a completely artificial bone all the way down. So this is called a mega endoprosthetic. Then you have custom endoprosthetics. These are usually used these days in the pelvis for complex deformities and reconstructions. And what you do with these is similar to what we used to do where we uh, now you know, measure everything precisely, but now we've got better tools like CT scans and MRI to do that, send it to a company and they actually do 3D printed titanium implants. So they use a 3D printer that can take the information from the CT scan or the MRI and print out an implant that is gonna fit that patient's anatomy perfectly and allow for fixation to the adjacent anatomy. So I always tell patients, whenever we rebuild an area, it's just like building a house. You need to have a strong foundation and you build off of the foundation. The foundation for every patient is bone. So you've gotta have bone that we can build off of. So this is one where we had to, if you look at the normal pelvis up here where we do an artificial hip, this is where we had to cut the pelvis up here, cut the pelvis down here and take out everything in between. So now we jump that gap with a huge chunk of metal that does have an artificial hip joint, but then it's got all this fixation that we're building off of the adjacent healthy normal bone. And so now rather than having to do a high level amputation on this patient, we can rebuild it and give them a hip joint and they can still bear weight and walk around and do a heck of a lot better than if we had to remove the entire pelvis and leg. So these sorts of implants have been a game changer. The biggest drawback to these implants is manufacturing time. It does take about eight weeks or so for an engineer to chat with the surgeon, figure out a game plan, figure out exactly how they wanna attack this, and then come up with the design and all the measurements and then have the computer printed out and then sterilize it all and get it shipped here. So these are often kind of hurry up and wait type of surgery. So if there is a big defect here and the patient has a lot of pain, but we do want to rebuild this and we don't want to cut their leg off, then we do have to talk about being non-weight bearing or living life in a wheelchair for a couple of months while we get this built so that we can go in there and safely do it. So in terms of endoprosthetic reconstruction, these are used to remove the tumor, rebuild the bone, and provide structural support in order to reestablish joint surfaces or bypass failed bone healing mechanisms because they've been overtaken by tumor or we've hit that area with radiation so hard that the bone just doesn't have any capability of healing anymore. So this was a patient that had breast cancer that was up here on the upper end of the femur and she did suffer a fracture. So this is what we would call a hip fracture. And so as a result, we had to replace it, but because breast cancer was also throughout other places in her bone, if I go back one slide, you can see a standard hip replacement ends down here. So we anchor it in there to get fixation, uh, but that's all it's doing. It's not really bypassing anything. It's just helping us fix this implant into the bone. But here we run this big, long special stem all the way down and it goes almost all the way down to her knee. That way we can bypass any structural problems being caused by the tumor in the bone. We can stabilize and support the entire bone, but we don't have to remove the entire bone. And why that's important is because in addition to bearing weight, our, our bones provide an anchoring point for all of our muscles. So when you have to cut the bone out, the muscles don't quite heal back to metal so perfectly. And so this enables us to pres preserve the patient's function a heck of a lot better. Here's another example of, of when we have to do a bigger you know, problem. So again, here's some metastatic breast cancer in the femur where you have these nodules right here where it has spread to several spots within this femur. And you can even see widening and changes in the bone on the outside here. So there's tumor involved on the sides of the bone. So it comes down here pretty good. And unfortunately, this patient did go on to fracture through that area after radiation attempted to kill the tumor and let it heal. So now we have a completely broken femur. We've got tumor all throughout it. So fixing it may not be the best option because the bone is just not good. But at the same time, this is certainly more bone than a standard hip replacement. So now what do we do? Those mega endoprosthetics come in where we replace other ways of rebuilding these defects, but because these surgeries are big and they're very specialized, this is why you need to come my way um, rather than kind of following up with your local doc if you do live far away from a center that has an orthopedic oncologist.
So what are some of the complications that arise with these? Because as you can imagine, some of these are huge surgeries and in patients with advanced cancers, and I will say, you name it, if you can come up with something bad that can happen, I guarantee it's happened. Um, and so one of the big parts of this, again, is, is multidisciplinary care, getting everyone involved off the bat so that everyone's keeping an eye on the patient so we can stave off medical complications, structural complications, mechanical complications, you know, all of that stuff. We get the medical team involved, we get the medical oncologists involved, the radiation oncologists. And so this really comes down to informed consent with the patient. It comes down to discussing what really are the options for this particular case with this particular anatomy involved. And then what are the, the expectations? What does the recovery look like? What can we expect to get out of this? What are the goals of the patient and their family? How old is the patient? What is their life expectancy? So there's no real algorithm here. It's a very customized individual basis type of conversation. And you could have the same conversation with two different patients and have the two different patients elect two totally different treatment options. And that's because patient autonomy plays a huge role. You know, we want the patient to take an active role in their cancer care and in their care when they're facing one of these issues. And so really this just comes down to having an, an open, you know, conversation and discussion with your whole treatment team to help determine what's going to be best for you. So in conclusion, orthopedic oncology is but a small part of the multidisciplinary care for these complicated cases here at Good Samaritan. Bone supports surgically and medically are the mainstays of metastatic breast cancer. So that includes uh, chemotherapy as well as what's called bone modifying agents or things like Reclast or Zometa, uh, Prolia or Nanosumab. These are bone strengthening drugs that are designed to uh, help, you know, the bone come back if it has been damaged by the tumor. But believe it or not, in breast cancer, they actually have a benefit in preventing the bone from even setting up shop in tumor in the first place. So they play a role even before the bone. Limb salvage surgery is a burgeoning and ongoing area of clinical and technological advances with many options currently available, but those options continue to get better and better and we continue to have more and more of them. Each case must be tailored to the specific patient. Anatomic considerations, the stage of the disease, the bone structure that's left and its proximity to the joints, the goals of the patient and their family, informed consent of the patient and their family, as well as the patient's expectations. What do they want to get out of this? What are they hoping to get out of this? And what do they expect to get out of this? And then again, having those questions answered and having an honest and open discussion to tailor a, a program that fits them you know, and, and makes them and their family the happiest and treats them the way they're looking for. So if you are interested in these topics, I just threw a couple of links in here that we can get you if you want. Uh, but the first one is just the link for the Pastega Cancer Center where you can read more about us, about what we're doing here, you know, what exactly the cancer center is all about. Um, then the uh, National Cancer Center um, has a, a good website on breast cancer that has a lot of the kind of epidemiology, a lot of the facts about it, the treatments, you know, all kinds of questions that can be answered. And then the last one there is the MSTS, which is the Musculoskeletal Tumor Society. That's my, you know, governing body, the, the overseer of all the orthopedic oncologists. And they're the ones where we present our research and we get uh, all of our newest, you know, technological advances out of is that particular group. So, uh, there are good resources if you're specifically interested in the orthopedic or the bone side of things. So that being said, I know we're, you know, a little bit ahead of schedule. And so I wanted to leave enough time to answer questions for everyone. And if you don't have any, then we can give you 20 minutes back of your lunch. <clears throat> Thanks, Dr. Tedesco. That was very informative and just the level of personalization and problem solving is, is very interesting. So thank you for sharing your expertise with us. For sure. Um, before we get to questions, I'm gonna go over a couple of key information about the Resource Center. So if you wanna go ahead and begin putting in your questions or comments into the gray question menu, that would be wonderful. Um, if you'd like to obtain any information or resources about cancer, the Cancer Resource Center can be reached a number of ways. 
We have physical locations in Albany and Corvallis, um, and you can call us or visit our website. Email is wonderful, cancerresourcecenter at samhealth.org is um, our email that we check daily. So if you have questions or comments, anything like that, please reach out to us, um, as well as Facebook, Instagram, and you can join our newsletter as well, which goes out monthly with um, additional updates throughout the month of what's going on. We have a few upcoming events. Interval Breast Cancer, which is going to be offered in Spanish and English, and Detección y Prevención del Cancer de Mama on Thursday, October 20th, and that will be offered in Spanish. Please um, reach out to us if you want to get registered for those. Um, the links are in our newsletter, but if you have trouble finding that, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to connect you with the, the links. Okay, now let's go over some questions. First up we have, can someone with stage four metastatic cancer in the bone not have any pain symptoms? That is an excellent question and the answer unfortunately is yes. Um, so part of what's called surveillance when you have a known diagnosis of breast cancer is often where we're imaging the patient either with PET scans, CT scans, or bone scans. And essentially what that's doing is always monitoring for signs of the tumor showing up somewhere else. So even if you had a primary breast cancer and it was treated um, with surgery and radiation, we don't consider that cured. We are always on the lookout for what's called a relapse. So we consider that in remission, meaning you don't have any detectable um, disease anywhere in your body that we can find. And so the ongoing surveillance is usually every like three to six months, you come in, you get your scans. If that looks good, awesome. You know, we keep going and then you come in again and then you come in again. And so there are times where we'll get those scans and whoop, it shows up in the bone and the patient had no idea, no symptoms. Likewise, patients can actually present in stage four um, for other reasons where they had some other issue, they get a scan never even were diagnosed with breast cancer, but lo and behold, they've got disease in their bones. We biopsy one of those areas and it shows us metastatic breast cancer. So unfortunately that can happen and that's one of the problems is it does need to reach a critical you know, size and eat away a critical amount of bone for you to start feeling it. Because what you actually feel isn't the tumor itself, you feel the structural failure or impending structural failure of the bone and that's what hurts and so until that bone starts to structurally be problematic you may not even know you have it and so that's why surveillance is so important once you do have that diagnosis so that we can detect it before you feel it so that we might be able to intervene earlier and maybe keep you out of the operating room thank you um can you speak to, I'm oh, sorry, I lost my screen here. <laughs> um, signs that breast cancer has spread. Are there specific symptoms that patients should be looking out for? By far and away, the most common is pain and usually very localized to wherever the tumor may be. So patients that you know, all of a sudden develop a pain in a specific part of their extremities or a rib or their back that's new for them, of course, it could be a strained muscle, it could be an injury, always, but always best to have it checked out if you have that diagnosis of breast cancer because you want to make sure that it's not something more nefarious. The patients that do present with that will usually describe it as kind of like a toothache pain. So it's this deep, boring pain that doesn't go away. So for instance, if you injure your knee, you throw some ice on it, you, you elevate it, you put a pillow behind it, and you feel better. With these types of things, there's no position of comfort. No matter how you try to position yourself and move things around, it, just, it still hurts. It still hurts. So those are the red flag symptoms that say, all right, I need to call my doctor and go get this checked out. Maybe it's not just a muscle strain or an ache and pain or, or arthritis or something like that. Like I said, it still absolutely could be, but we don't know till we look. Uh, so always be on the lookout for new aches and pains, especially when there's no reason. You didn't have a fall, you didn't have an injury, and now the middle of your arm hurts. Something might be up. You know, we got to get that checked out. 
Um, someone in our audience had larynx cancer and was wondering if the epiglottis can be repaired. Hmm, that's a good question. That's one of the few areas I don't operate. That's normally going to be an ENT physician, but just from what I know in the extremities, I, I will say in medicine, we never say never. There's always some solution out there. It may not be the best. It may not be perfect, um, but there probably is some sort of procedure. A lot of times with those things, because the epiglottis is a sort of a soft tissue membrane type of structure, but it has a little bit more structure to it. So almost like your ear, for instance, uh, where it holds a shape and it has some rigidity to it, even though it's soft. Um, they can graft you know, different tissues from elsewhere in your body sometimes, and even in the musculoskeletal system, I know we can use cadaver grafting. So just like when patients die and they donate their liver and their kidneys, they donate their bones and tendons. So that's definitely a better question for an ENT doc to know specifically what's out there, but I'd be willing to bet there's something. Okay, so follow up with the ENT would be a good uh, course yep. for that. Thank you. Um, another participant, um, their grandmother is 85 <clears throat> and was recently diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer to bone. Can you speak to life expectancy for someone um, at that age or if that impacts treatment options? And do you have experience working with patients at that age? Yeah, you betcha. So seeing lots of folks in that age and all over the map, you know, where they were diagnosed at that age with stage four breast cancer, meaning they never even knew they had breast cancer and they presented in stage four already. I've treated patients at that age that had breast cancer years ago, but now it has relapsed at that age in stage four. Um, so we do see those things and those are unfortunate problems. Where we go from there, again, it becomes very individualized. And so whenever we talk about survival and, and a doc quotes, well, you know, we're looking at 18 months to two years or something like that. Essentially what they're quoting is there are national epidemiologic studies that look at population-based databases. So for instance, there's a Medicare database that keeps track of every patient in the US that has Medicare. There's also something called the SEER database which is a national cancer registry. And so we can look at those databases and get 50,000 patients and we can say, okay, for those patients in stage four at age 85, how many of them are alive in two years? And we say, well, 40%. Uh, so we say two year survival is 40%. So that means 60% of patients don't make it two years. That's the majority. So we're gonna tell patients, well, the majority of people don't last two years. The problem with that is this is a very individual thing because as we talked about before, not all stage four is the same, not all stage four is treated the same, not all stage four has the same prognosis. And stage four that's a relapse is treated differently than stage four that's presenting in the first place. So it's really hard to quantify that for any patient. And so what I always tell my patients is here are the national numbers, but what does that mean for you? Nothing. You're an individual. We have no idea what the future holds for you. We will get as aggressive as you want to get, or we'll back off as much as you want to back off. But we don't know, you know, where this is going to go for you. Are you going to be one of those stage four people that get cured? You might. Are you going to be a stage four person that dies in three weeks? You might. You know, we don't know. And so that's the hardest part in all of this is those numbers and and things that we quote really are just coming from looking at the general masses but they really don't allow us to drill down to all of those specifics that really go into prognosticating a patient you know when you look at those databases you can't find well what other medical problems did that patient had what other treatments did they already go through what other, you know, so we can't answer those questions definitively. And so the treatment is different for all of those patients. So at her age, at 85, if this is the first time she's been diagnosed with, with breast cancer, she's already in stage four. Primary chemotherapy for breast cancer often involves a drug called adriamycin. And adriamycin is very toxic to the heart. And so as a result, it's generally considered not safe in patients over 85. So what it means for a patient, or I'm sorry, over 65, there's certainly a lot of gray zones there and there are some new drugs that find different ways to deliver adriamycin that are less toxic to the heart. 
But in general, at that age, it takes away our biggest gun that we have for breast cancer. And so it means we've got to move down the line to something that's not so toxic. Um, as we talked about before, one of the mainstays in stage four is usually getting genetic testing on that specific tumor to try and find a genetic error that we have a drug that targets. If we can find one of those, that's what you'll get. And those tend to have better toxicity profiles because they're targeting a specific thing and they're not generalized killing cells. Those are the ones that give you lots of side effects. And so it tends to be better tolerated and again, helps prolong survival of the patient. So when it comes to that particular patient, I would say, who knows? You know, this She may die of something else other than breast cancer if they can turn it into more of a chronic disease, but it sounds like you know, she needs to be looked at, she needs to have that conversation, they need to figure out you know, the next line of chemotherapy that may help her and they need to figure out, are there any targeted chemotherapy agents that can help her? And then the sky's the limit. Thank you. So in other words, you know, we're providing patients with information to make an, an informed decision, right? And then- Exactly. Um, yeah, okay, exactly. wonderful. Um, can metastatic cancer be in any bone or are there generally specific bones that cancers travel to? Yeah, so technically it can be in any bone. I've seen metastatic cancer even in the small bones in the fingers. Um, those aren't common. And so generally, yes, there are areas that are far more common. Cancer, we, when it spreads to bone, tends to do so in a fashion where it starts centrally and heads peripherally. So by far and away, the spine is the most common place to find metastatic cancer in bone. Then the pelvis and the shoulder blades, then the upper end of the humerus and the upper end of the femur, then the lower end of the humerus and the lower end of the femur, then below the knee and then below the elbow. So it tends to go in order. Normally, when we catch it early, we catch it centrally. When we catch it late, it's out in the periphery. Uh, not always the case. Sometimes patients truly have one spot that it is spread to and it's the humerus or it's the femur. Uh, but most of the time it starts centrally, heads peripherally. But like I said, technically it can show up in any bone in the body. Is chemotherapy necessary for stage four metastatic cancer to bone? Good question. So chemotherapy, by and large is sort of a garbage basket term. We use the term chemotherapy that actually just means chemical therapy. So technically an antibiotic for uh, strep throat is chemotherapy. Um, so when I say chemotherapy, I don't necessarily mean the historical definition of chemotherapy, which is what's called cytotoxic chemotherapy. Those are like adriamycin, the drugs that kill rapidly dividing cells. So they don't discriminate amongst tumor versus not tumor, they just kill anything that's dividing. And so that's why they have a lot of side effects because a lot of cells in our body are dividing and need to divide, that's part of how we maintain ourselves. Um, and so when you say the word chemotherapy, a lot of patients think of those classic older drugs that are fraught with you know, toxic side effect profiles. These days, even the targeted chemotherapy is very different. So it doesn't disrupt cell division. Instead, it finds a genetic mutation that a cancer cell has and hits it so that it can't access that mutation anymore, which is usually what's driving that tumor to grow. And so then it completely halts the tumor uh, growth and can, can even kill it. So, Chemotherapy is somewhat of a nebulous term, so it doesn't quite mean uh, maybe what you think it means. So that being said, is chemotherapy necessary in stage four? And the answer is, you know, no. The patient always has autonomy. If it, ha if it has spread all over the place and it's in 150 areas and the patient is 92 and they say, you know what, I've lived a good life, I don't want anything, you know, we're not obligated to treat her. You know, we'll keep them comfortable, we'll do everything we can to ease their transition, but we don't have to treat them. However, if we're going for, I want my life prolonged and maybe cured, then yes, some form of chemotherapy has to play a role. And that's because if it is spread to one or two or three spots and they're in anatomically favorable positions, yeah, we can cut them out. But if it's in 100 spots, we can't cut that much tissue out and keep the patient alive. So the only thing we have in our armamentarium that can attack 
that many tumors is some form of chemical therapy. And so the newer um, targeted agents often are just pills that the patient takes at home, whereas the historic therapy was an, was and is an infusion, where you actually have to come into an infusion center, they hook up your IV, and then off, off to work they go. Or sometimes you even need to be an inpatient to have that done. So um, like I said, chemotherapy is sort of a garbage basket term. There are lots of things that fall under that. But if we are going for some sort of prolonged survival, then yes, some sort of chemical usually has to play a role in managing metastatic breast cancer. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't see any more questions at this time. If anyone does have additional questions after we log off, feel free to email us at cancerresourcecenter at samhealth.org. We'd be happy to um, get those questions to Dr. Tedesco and get an answer back to you. I want to sincerely thank everyone for your questions and engagement today. And even if you just were listening, that's wonderful too. We really appreciate you um, coming on today. And you will be seeing a survey pop up on your screen afterwards. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, that helps us um, tailor these talks to uh, subjects that you guys want to hear about. And we really appreciate it. And big thank you to Dr. Tedesco. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you guys for having me and great questions. Hope my answers weren't too long-winded. <laughs> they were very thorough. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. You can log off now and have a great lunch.